Thanks for coming along tonight, for, folks, for what will be our second last function of the year. So many thanks to those who have come along and thanks to those who are tuned in on Zoom and, of course, elsewhere later on after the speech on Sky News and on our website and other places. Um, it's great to have um, Paul Fletcher back at the Sydney Institute. We think it's his fourth time here, um, but he's very welcome. Now, he's well known to you, but I will introduce him briefly. Uh, he worked as a ministerial staffer. He was a senior executive at, at Optist. Optus. He became the uh, member for Bradfield in 2009. In the recent government, Paul Fletcher was the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts. And in opposition, he's a shadow minister for government services in the digital economy. And the topic of tonight's t talk is the digital economy and the coalition. Paul Fletcher, you're very welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jared. It's great to be back at the Sydney Institute and well done to you and Anne for the creation and maintenance of this very important forum for public policy debate over now many, many years. Well, recently I dropped in to visit the huge new Bunnings store in Pimble in my electorate and the store manager told me how much business the store is doing with tradies because when they stop at Bunnings, they can use the Bunnings PowerPass digital app to speed up the process of picking up supplies for the job they're working on and making payment. PowerPass also captures and stores a digital record of all the purchases you make from Bunnings, which makes for a much more efficient process of doing your accounts and lodging your tax return at the end of the year. This is but one of countless examples which could be given of how the digital transformation of our economy is bringing efficiency, productivity and quality of life benefits. So today I want to speak about the digital economy. I want to start by arguing that the digital transformation of our economy is fundamentally important. Next I want to touch on how far we've come as a nation in no small measure due to coalition government policy settings over the last 30 years. And thirdly, I want to argue for some clear priorities if we are to capture further benefits from this digital transformation of our economy. Well, let me turn firstly then to why the digital economy matters. Why is fostering this digital transformation such a big deal? The first reason is defensive. Think about how many jobs there were in classified advertising sales for newspapers or for the yellow pages 30 years ago. Those jobs have gone because internet-based internet businesses like Facebook, Seek and Domain have taken over the advertising market. Unless Australian businesses are innovating and adopting digital technology, they will not survive. The second reason, of course, is that the digital economy allows entirely new businesses and sectors to grow and flourish, creating jobs and prosperity. Just think of the various categories which simply did not exist 30 years ago. <coughs> Streaming video mRNA vaccines, drones, low earth orbiting satellites, additive manufacturing are just a few which come to mind. Globally, companies such as Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Samsung and Tencent have achieved extraordinary growth very quickly through developing innovative digital products and services. In Australia, there are plenty of examples of companies doing the same. Seek was founded in 1997 and became a top 100 company. Today, its market cap exceeds $8 billion. Atlassian was founded in 2001 and now has a market cap of $48 billion. Safety Culture, a digital platform to automate workplace safety inspections, was started in a Townsville garage in 2004. It's now a $2 billion company. Canva began in 2013 and today, even after recent market gyrations, is valued at over $30 billion. Excitingly, there's a very big pipeline of other digital economy businesses in Australia at various stages of development. To take just one example, the space sector, which was a real focus for the Morrison government. I recently had the chance to visit Fleet Space Technologies in Adelaide, a company which has almost doubled in size over the last 12 months. Their clever approach of using nano satellite technology to scan for minerals underground has reduced the timeline in prospecting for minerals reserves from several years down to a matter of days. There are plenty of other Australian space businesses I could mention, including Sabre Astronautics, Space Machines and Gilmore Space Technologies. Now, a third reason why the digital economy matters so much is that digital technology delivers big efficiency gains for businesses in long existing sectors like mining and retail. 
It lets companies operate more efficiently, lift their productivity, generate more profits and raise income for workers. Mining companies have embraced automation as a means of overcoming the challenges of remote work sites. Rio Tinto operates more than 130 autonomous trucks at its iron ore facilities. The internet has allowed retailers to reach new markets and serve customers in new ways. Look at the way Gabby and Hezi Libovich built the national online business catch of the day. Starting in 2006, by 2019, they had hundreds of employees and sold the business for over $1 billion. Online retailers can serve national and even global markets, and they can do it from just about anywhere. Consider the online fashion retailer Bird's Nest. Based in the New South Wales Snowy Mountains town of Cooma, they've built up to now employ some 150 people. As Australia Post's 2022 annual report highlights, the pandemic turbo boosted a strong existing trend for Australians to buy online. In the year ended 30 June 2022, more than four in five Australian households shopped online. Online spend at $67 billion made up 20% of total retail spend, and online spending was up 11.9% on the previous year. Now, a fourth reason why the digital economy matters for Australia in particular is that it ends the tyranny of distance. Historically, it was tough for Australian businesses to serve global markets because of the time and cost required to ship product from Australia to other countries. But when your product is digital, so it's weightless and instantaneous, that problem disappears. Australia could not be globally competitive making and exporting cars, big metal boxes which cost a lot to ship. But technology businesses serving the global automotive market based in Australia absolutely can be competitive. Adelaide-based Coda Wireless makes software for connected and automated vehicles and has won contracts with global automakers. Baraha, a company that in its early years was based at the CSIRO facility in West Linfield, a my electorate, has developed improved LiDAR technology, a key component of automated vehicles. Well, a fifth reason that the digital economy matters is because it's key to solving the productivity problem facing our economy. The Productivity Commission points out that our national productivity growth is at its lowest rate in 60 years. Now, as the example of fleet space technologies shows, if a mining company can do in a few days what previously took some years, that is a big productivity gain. One of the main ways to improve productivity is to make the economy more competitive. If companies have to work harder to keep existing customers, or acquire new ones, they will find new ways to become more productive. This is where initiatives like the consumer data right are so important. Legislated by the coalition, the consumer data right empowers consumers to share their data. It enables consumers to safely share the data that businesses hold about them, for example, banking data, helping to make comparisons between products and services easier so consumers can find products and services best suiting them. A good example of how the digital economy can boost productivity is in the potential for greater provision of finance to small and medium businesses. Increasingly, lenders are able to apply artificial intelligence to the banking records of the business, contained of course in digital files, to determine factors such as the earnings and cash flow of that business, seasonal variations, growth rates and much more. As I've heard from lenders as varied as NAB, Block and Shift, this is making it possible to provide finance to businesses where, on more traditional criteria, it might have been declined. In turn, that means more small and medium businesses are able to secure finance, pursue growth opportunities, serve customers, and create jobs. It also stimulates competition, as more businesses compete to provide ultimately better products and services, and that in turn contributes to productivity improvement. I want to turn now to looking at how far Australia has come in building a digital economy, drawing on um, the fortunate perspective that I've enjoyed, having been able to work in this policy space on and off for more than 25 years. For a long time, there was a fear that Australia was well behind global trends, that we did not have homegrown tech companies and the extraordinary digital transformation of the global economy was bad news for our country. In a 1998 report, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia warned 
quotes, the levels of technology in the richest East Asian countries generally will surpass those in Australia, quotes, and that partly as a result of that, we would, quotes, become a low wage and low salary country compared to the richest East Asian countries, close quotes. Well, as it's turned out, the Australian economy has performed much better than many feared. Our GDP per capita has more than tripled from around $24,300 in current prices in the four quarters to June 2002 to $88,800 in the four quarters to June 2022. So over 20 years, we've gone in constant dollar terms from about $24,300 GDP per capita to 88,800. That's an extraordinary rise. We've gone from being the 15th largest economy in the world in 1992 to the 13th largest in 2021. Now, much of this story is due to the growth of sectors like resources, agriculture, education and finance. But a strong part of the story has been the growth of Australia's technology sector. Look at some of the indicators. According to a recent Tech Council of Australia report, our tech sector is now equivalent to 8.5% of Australia's GDP, with overall activity valued at $167 billion, contributing more than 860,000 jobs directly and indirectly. You can look at Australian technology companies which have a global presence. Atlassian, for example, reports having 236,000 customers in approximately 200 countries. Canva cites over 75 million people in more than 190 countries using its products. CSL has 30,000 employees in over 40 countries around the world. I think one of the most interesting comparisons is in the makeup of the annual rich list, today published by the AFR and historically by BRW. If you look at the most recent rich list in 2022, 23 out of 200 on that list made their money in technology. The pattern is even stronger for those under 40 on the rich list, 26 out of 81. By contrast, if you look at the rich list of 1992, 30 years ago, the money typically came from sectors such as property, agriculture, retail and manufacturing. Now, much of this transformation has been the work of a capitalist economy. Smart people have seen opportunities and have built businesses. But there have also been important government policy settings designed to support and foster the digital economy in Australia. This has been a focus for Liberal governments going back to the Howard government, with initiatives like establishing the National Office for the Information Economy in 1997, and setting up a regulatory framework for early stage venture capital limited partnerships in 2002. Over nearly 30 years, we've had a consistent focus on making it more commercially attractive to invest in innovative and startup businesses. Under Prime Minister Turnbull, our 2016 National Innovation and Science Agenda further improved tax settings for early stage venture capital limited partnerships and provided additional tax incentives for early stage investors in startup businesses. Under the Morrison government, we set clear goals to build Australia's digital economy including the ambition of making Australia a top 10 digital economy and society by 2030, and supporting this ambition with a detailed digital economy plan. The numbers show that capital is flowing strongly into digital economy businesses, at least partly in response to these policy measures. Cambridge Associates reported last year that some $30.3 billion of capital had been raised to date, the latest KPMG Venture Pulse report shows first quarter 2022 venture capital deals in Australia were worth over $1.9 billion, the second biggest quarter ever. But while we're making good progress, there's much more to do. So let me turn then thirdly to suggest some steps I believe we need to take now to further drive the digital transformation of Australia's economy. And I want to argue for five such steps. Firstly, commit to the digital economy as a clear national priority. Secondly, drive digital take up in sectors which lag, including small business. Thirdly, a national digital identity system. Fourthly, digital delivery of government services. And finally, a coherent plan to address cyber security risks. The first thing we need to do then is to make the digital economy a clear national priority. In government, 
the coalition appointed a minister for the digital economy. Our digital economy strategy progressed technological and digital advancement of small businesses, our workforce, startups, and infrastructure. Under the current government, such clarity is lacking. There is no minister for the digital economy. There should be. There is no clear digital economy goal committed to by the Australian government. There should be. There needs to be a forward-looking commitment to the digital economy, not a backward-looking emphasis on 1950s-style employment patterns favoured by union bosses, which appears to have been the priority of the Albanese government in its first six months. Our next priority should be to drive digital take-up in sectors which lag. As Communications Minister, I established the Australian Broadband Advisory Council, and at my request, that council <coughs> did a series of studies looking at particular sectors where there is a big prize available from greater digital take-up, including healthcare, agriculture, the creative economy, and construction. A key reason there are missed digital economies in these sectors today is that they're disaggregated, with large numbers of small businesses rather than a small number of large players. This, in turn, makes it harder to generate sector-wide take-up of the kind of software and applications which would allow much greater efficiency. By contrast, digital take-up tends to be faster in sectors where one or more large players have the means and motivation to drive the industry-wide take-up of a particular standard. Look at the implementation of the new payments platform in the banking sector, for example. This has, this has delivered considerable consumer benefits. Under OSCO, money now gets transferred virtually instantly. I believe that there are big economic gains if we can get similar sector-wide take-up of digital technologies across our economic sectors that are more disaggregated, like health or construction. Imagine if there were a health sector-wide standard for the movement of patient information between GPs, specialists, pharmacists and all the other stakeholders. Today, all too often, there are still handwritten letters going from a GP to a specialist, carried there by the patient or faxed and that doubtless frequently lost or misplaced. There should be a focus across some key sectors, which would certainly include health, construction, tourism and the creative economy, on arriving at industry-wide digital standards. Part of that work needs to be giving industry participants strong incentives to use the standards. Another part of that work is identifying the players whose behaviour can drive take-up by others. Bunnings, with the PowerPass app I cited earlier, is an example of a player which is influencing digital take-up across the construction sector. But another obvious group of influencers is the accountants. Their advice is often key to small and medium businesses adopting cloud-based accounting packages from providers like MYOB and Xero. And in turn, once a small business takes up one cloud-based application, it typically starts to take up others. So if we want to drive digital take-up by businesses which are lagging, uh, a sector-by-sector -sector approach, as, I, as I've argued, is one strategy. But it should be complemented by an economy-wide focus on small and medium businesses. Small businesses account for nearly a third of Australia's total GDP. But many small businesses have not adopted digital technology. They're still using shoeboxes to store their paper receipts and invoices. According to a survey carried out by YouGov for software provider SAP last year, almost one third of the Australian small businesses surveyed are still conducting the majority of their record keeping physically. Now, of course, this is partly generational. Tradies in their 20s and 30s, for example, are not only bigger users of the Bunnings app than tradies of my age, they are also using other tools like Solo Assist, especially for quoting on jobs, Tradeify, ServiceMate, and zero for their accounting. But whatever their age, if small business owners can see an immediate and practical benefit from going digital, then they're more likely to do so. And one such practical benefit would be if issuing, bill, issuing their bills was quicker and easier and resulted in quicker and more reliable payment. And that's where electronic invoicing can make a big difference. The survey I mentioned earlier has some positive news. Businesses which have transitioned to e-invoicing have been pleasantly surprised, with 9 in 10 describing it as easy. They found it saved time and money and meant more accurate and secure record keeping. And it's also been a catalyst for digitising other business processes with survey respondents citing payroll, <coughs> debt collection, user and customer experience and talent management. 
A major driver, therefore, which could get many more small businesses online would be a clear national strategy to use e-invoicing. Australian government departments and agencies transact with millions of small businesses. There should be an Australian government-wide policy that its preferred means of being invoiced by small business suppliers is through e-invoicing and a commitment to pay such e-invoices within a specific and small number of days. This would be a powerful way to incentivise and drive the rapid adoption of e-invoicing by millions of small businesses and in turn for it to become the standard economy-wide. The saving in terms of the number of hours presently spent in preparing and issuing paper invoices and of then chasing them up, of reconciling payments against invoices and all of the other business processes would be substantial. Let me turn then to a third priority for stimulating the digital transformation of the economy, the adoption of a national digital identity system. Today, when you or I go to a bank to set up a new bank account or to a telco to get a new mobile service, we typically provide evidence of our identity through documents such as a driver's licence, a utility bill, and that identity information is then retained on file. But imagine if I could establish my identity simply by keying in my name to the website of the bank or telco, then typing in a multi-digit code just sent to me by my trusted identity provider. Once I did this, the bank or the telco's computer system would electronically be able to access the computer system of my trusted identity provider, which would electronically certify that I was in fact Paul Fletcher and provide one-time verification of other information required, for example, the fact that I was over 18. The advantage of this system is that my identity data is stored once. I'll initially have gone through a process with the trusted identity provider under which my identity is verified through electronic checks against secure government records, such as those of the Australian Passport Office, the Australian Taxation Office by a state government driver's licence system, and under which I also provide biometric information in the form of a photo of my face taken with my smartphone. Once my identity is established with the trusted identity provider, I can then use it to open a new bank account or customer account with a telco, or in all the other situations in modern life where you need to establish your identity. Critically, this would mean that the bank, the telco, the other organisation would not need to store my data. There would, of course, be rigorous requirements on the trusted identity provider to maintain the highest standards of security and encryption. Well, such a system is pretty much ready to go. Following several years of work led by the Digital Transformations, Transformation Agency under the Morrison government, <clears throat> that work included public consultation and last year issuing an exposure draft of the Trusted Digital Identity Bill. Already, such a system is in operation through MyGov ID for Australians to deal with federal government agencies. But if the bill becomes law, then it will allow other organisations to become trusted identity providers and it will set out the legal regime for the trusted digital identity to be used to establish identity with private sector organisations and state and territory governments. Unfortunately, the development of such a system, which the coalition government commenced in 2015, has stalled significantly under the Albanese government. There should be a renewed and urgent focus on digital identity and on legislating an appropriate regulatory framework. This brings me to a fourth priority in driving the digital transformation of Australia's economy, continuing the push to improve digital service delivery by the Commonwealth Government. In New South Wales, under the leadership of Customer Service Minister Victor Dominello, Service New South Wales is doing outstanding work to serve citizens digitally. They broke new ground with the convenience of a digital driver's licence carried on your smartphone. Next year we'll see a digital birth certificate and digital trade licences available in the Service New South Wales app to help tradies get on the job more quickly. We need to see the same customer service mentality at work in the federal government, deploying digital tools and channels to serve citizens more quickly and efficiently. It's clear that there is huge demand from citizens <coughs> In 2019, on average, around 571,000 people were accessing MyGov every day. By October 2021, this had reached almost 2 million. Under the previous government, the Morrison government, there was a big focus on digitally delivering more services. The Digital Transformation Agency sat at the heart of government in Prime Minister and Cabinet, charged with driving the transition of service delivery from physical to digital. Their achievements included upgrading the MyGov app, expanding the digital identity system and introducing digital assistance to improve customer experience. 
Unfortunately, since the election of the Albanese government, the Digital Transformation Agency has been relegated to the Finance Department, and there's no single minister clearly and publicly charged with driving the digital transformation of government. This is a missed opportunity compared to the approach of coalition governments both federally and in New South Wales over recent years. Priority number five should be a clear and coherent plan to boost Australia's response to cyber security challenges. Data breaches are sadly nothing new with the Australian National University, the Australian Parliament, the Victorian Department of Health and freight company Toll <coughs> amongst high profile victims in recent years. But the Optus and Medibank private hacks this year have been particularly serious. There are many millions of Australians who are customers or former customers of the two companies and hence have potentially had their personal information compromised. <coughs> this is obviously bad news for those affected Australians, but it's also bad news in broader policy terms. The repeated occurrence of large-scale data breaches reduces confidence amongst both businesses and customers in using digital services and channels. It therefore makes it harder for our economy to capture the productivity and efficiency benefits I've spoken of. According to the Australian Cyber Security Centre, the past 12 months saw over 76,000 cyber crime reports, an increase of 13% from the previous financial year. The average cost per cyber crime report for small business reached $39,000 and for medium business, $88,000. Regrettably, the current government's response has not given Australians much confidence. There's been too much blame shifting and short term politics. We have not seen much evidence of a coherent and considered plan. One element of such a plan would be the adoption of a trusted digital identity framework, as I've mentioned. Another would be to establish a more consistent compliance framework, reducing the existing <coughs> regulatory overlap. Today, for example, businesses must comply with requirements set by both the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and the Australian Cyber Security Centre. They should be standardised. The overall framework needs careful design so it does not cause disincentives for businesses to promptly report breaches when they occur. And while the Coalition supports proposed increases in penalties for privacy breaches, these need to be scaled. Small and medium enterprises shouldn't be subject to the same penalties as major corporates. Another useful element of a plan would be incentives for businesses to take practical steps to reduce the risk of being hacked. This approach formed part of the technology investment boost introduced by the previous coalition government in the March 2022 budget. This provided an extra 20% tax deduction for businesses with a turnover up to $50 million on top of existing deductions for spending on specified digital economy investments. Eligible spending includes cyber security systems, backup management and monitoring services. But there is scope to do more. A particular source of cyber security risk is the extensive use of legacy systems. For example, in early 2020, Microsoft ceased supporting Windows 7, meaning there are no more updates or security patches being provided. Yet many businesses still use this operating system, many more use earlier ones, and those businesses are therefore at greater risk of being hacked. Incentives to encourage businesses to upgrade could be an important tool to reduce risk across the economy. Well, let me conclude then with the observation that the digital economy needs to be a major policy priority for the Australian government. As a nation, we've come a long way in the last 30 years. But after sustained work by coalition governments over that time, there is a lack of focus on the digital economy from the current government. I've argued that there are several concrete steps the government could take to regain that focus. The stakes are high. It is simply too important for our national prosperity and our economic growth that policy on the digital economy be left adrift. Thank you. So um, many thanks to uh, Paul Fletcher. So we come to our question discussion period um, and you're right on time, so we've got plenty of time. You, you spoke earlier about the, the lack of productivity growth. I think you went back three mm. decades. But then you spoke about this extraordinary growth over two decades in income. So how did one happen without the other? And if the productivity had gone the way you're suggesting it should have gone, that would have made a difference to the income beyond what it was. So how come we became richer without the necessary productivity growth, which you would expect? Well, um, I guess the point I'm making is that we know that productivity grew pretty sharply up until the early 2000s, and it's been 
coming off uh, since then. What we also know, though, is that if we uh, want to be able to find a sustainable basis to continue to deliver wage increases, that needs to ultimately be founded in productivity. Uh, what we don't want to do is get into an inflationary wage price spiral. And the opportunity, therefore, is to use technology to underpin uh, productivity growth in many sectors. Now, uh, one of the sectors where we've not seen conspicuous productivity growth is government. Uh, and indeed, I was quite surprised when I looked into this a few years ago and discovered that essentially productivity is not measured or included in the national, oh, sorry, government productivity is not measured or included in the, in, the, in the government productivity statistics. But it is clear that there's a strong customer appetite, uh, those dealing with government to do so through digital channels. And if we could improve the productivity of government, that would be one material step. But I've also sought to argue in this speech that uh, we've got industries and sectors, particularly the disaggregated sectors, where we are not making full use of the capacity of digital technology to drive productivity improvements. And so my point simply is that, yes, we have seen uh, strong growth in Australia's economy over the last 20 uh, plus years, uh, but we do know that through that time, uh, productivity growth has been slowing. And in my view, one of the ways to address that and to get productivity improvements is to drive uh, to have greater take up of digital technology in sectors where it is presently underutilised and in turn uh, that will deliver productivity benefits. There's a question here. and There's some water for the speaker so we can hear him. Are we on? Just hold on. Are we on? Yes. No, thank you. Just hang on one second. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes. You go. Yeah. Um, Minister, sorry, Shadow Minister. Citizen. Thank Call you. me citizen. That was pretty comprehensive. And obviously, it's a huge portfolio uh, or shadow portfolio. Assuming that whatever, you might be the next minister in the same portfolio, are you confident that you, as a minister, would have enough? competent and educated staff to be able to handle this massive breadth of responsibility? So one of the features of a portfolio like this, certainly the way it operated when we were in government, was that to a significant extent it's about coordinating and aligning across government. Because in one sense to have a specific focus on a digital economy um, comes up against the challenge that every sector is digital. If you look at agriculture, for example, which I didn't really have time to talk about in detail, but the, the rate of take-up of digital technology in the agriculture sector is extraordinary. Um, combine harvesters uh, or tractors or other uh, big pieces of machinery that are uh, feeding back data to their manufacturer at all times, uh, following precision pathways as they move up and down the field so that they're not uh, going over the same, same ground twice. Uh, technology, soil moisture monitoring and all kinds of other technology feeding into decision support systems so that farmers can apply the optimal amount of water and of fertiliser, no more, no less. Um, that is just one sector. Uh, I talked a little bit about resources where, again, an extraordinary uptake of technology and I touched a bit on the Australian space sector where satellites are increasingly allowing coverage of even the most remote parts of Australia and the kind of applications, digital applications that are making mining more efficient using satellite and other communications means are quite remarkable. So um, uh, the, the reality is that our economy, um, just about every sector of the economy has a digital story to tell. And as I sought to argue, many of our sectors like finance, like banking, uh, have, have fundamentally transformed through the use of digital technology. But there are other sectors where it's still very patchy. And again, if you think of the construction sector, you've got you know, some of the very big players, the lend leases and so on, who are typically the prime contractors. Then you've got a, a, a series of 
smaller players down to uh, the individual uh, plumbers and electricians and others uh, who are contracted or subcontracted onto particular jobs. Now, because of the disaggregated nature of the sector, uh, there's not a kind of standard in terms of the particular digital applications that is used to move money around or to use planning tools. Um, there are some amazing things happening, uh, so-called digital twins, that's to say capturing uh, when, a, when, when the plans for a building are done, um, they're captured digitally and maintained uh, and they're a tool that's used by a property manager. And there are some uh, really interesting Australian companies doing great work in that space. But even so, there's, there's not um, an industry-wide standard. So that's a very long-winded answer. But in, in short, what I'd argue is that the big opportunity in, di in the digital economy is to establish industry standards and to particularly focus on uh, industries and sectors that are not yet capturing the full benefit of digital technology. Thank you, Shadow Minister, uh, for that. You pointed to the weaknesses and you pointed to weaknesses in small business, but of course, traditionally, they have been, as you said, the, one of the real strengths of the economy. Yet directors of small businesses are currently sitting at the board table, constantly told they need to do more about cyber security, and the first thing they can do is make sure they don't have too much information stored. And yet, as you earlier pointed out, AI on information is one of the areas where we can grow productivity. And the government's answer to date is, well, we're going to increase penalties. Yeah. Um, so realistically and practically for small business, how can government help small business get over this cyber security drama so they actually can start to take up the digital economy? Look, it's an excellent question. I sought to touch on that in my remarks about the need for a plan. Uh, and I want to acknowledge the great work that uh, James Patterson, our shadow uh, minister for cyber security, has been doing. Uh, also, Sarah Henderson, our shadow communications minister, and uh, a number of other colleagues, because this is an issue that extends across many portfolios. But you're right, I think, firstly, to point to the fact that one of the first things the present government has done is talked about increased penalties. And the risk is that that creates a, a, a disincentive for management teams, whether it's of small businesses or big corporations, to uh, disclose as quickly as they should. Now, I was clear in my remarks that the coalition uh, supports increased penalties, but we want to see some uh, gradation here, um, recognising the different scale of smaller and larger companies. But then the next thing is, what in practical terms can small businesses do uh, to manage cybersecurity risk and also how can you make fear of cybersecurity risk, how can you prevent that being a blocker to small businesses taking up technology and getting the efficiencies that they can? Well, one very clear thing is to adopt cloud. There are still too many businesses around the country that have a server sitting in a back room and they're worried about, they're therefore you know, taking on the physical responsibility for that, having to update the software themselves. This is where the accounting uh, products like Xero and MYOB can be uh, important because they're often the way that a business chooses to, to take up cloud-based software. And once you're doing that, then your data is stored um, you know, in a data center managed by a, a, a large industrial grade uh, supplier. And typically, and I quoted some survey evidence, that once small businesses have taken up one cloud application, they tend to take up others as well. So certainly I think going to the cloud um, is uh, a practical way, one practical measure to deal with uh, cyber security risks. And I also touched in my speech on the fact that in the March budget this year, we provided some additional tax incentives for businesses to invest in uh, digital tools of various kinds, software, hard hardware, including cybersecurity protections. And so we certainly want to see that maintained um, and we need to give uh, businesses the support to make the investment they need to make. Um, <coughs> Shadow Minister, Speaker, Citizen. Mm. Um, Talking to a pharmacist, local pharmacist, the other day, after <coughs> holding up my mobile with my e-script, mm. and we're all in favour of it, he was all in favour of e-medicine. But I said to him, where is it at? He said, well, it's going nowhere because 
even in, and I said, oh, the states, it isn't national. He said, no, it's worse than that. Within the states, you have regions, and the regions don't agree. And so what, to what extent is the systems we've set up, are the systems we've set up before the digital economy in the way of getting through to the digital economy? And it could be in other areas as well. The health sector is a very interesting one to look at because, as you rightly say, we've got um, now electronic prescriptions. Uh, there's also been sustained efforts to set up a national uh, medical record system. So the vision is that you arrive in the emergency room, you're unconscious, uh, but uh, the treating doctor is able to immediately access your full digital med medical records. We can all see how beneficial that would be. The challenge is that a lot of very human factors tend to slow take up of this. And one of those factors is that in medicine, as in so many other sectors, a lot of uh, the participants are small businesses. If you're a general practitioner, if you're a specialist, you're essentially a small business. And so it's a classic small business problem. Uh, the amount of time you have to think about, okay, which technology am I going to use in my business is, is pretty limited. We saw this uh, when I was communications minister during the pandemic. We did a bit of work with medical practices after Greg Hunter's health minister uh, introduced a Medicare rebate number for teleconsulting. Um, that occurred quite quickly. Uh, the take-up was quite quick because people wanted to be able to engage with their doctors but were wary about going into, into, uh, into the GP's practice and, and potentially being exposed to COVID. Um, and what, from, what the NBM wanted to do was encourage GPs and other medical practitioners to have the right software and equipment in their practice to support video conferencing. But um, it struck a, a few difficulties because amongst other things, it turns out that there are three or four different providers of practice management software for GPs. Each of them has roughly the same market share. So <clears throat> you would need to strike arrangements with all of them. Uh, long way way of saying technology is part of it, but human behaviour and, um, you know, organisational dynamics and what are the business incentives are always factors here. And that's why I sought to draw the contrast between, say, the banking sector, where if you can get the four big banks in a room, they take a decision that sets the standard, obviously in alignment with the RBA and the regulators, other regulators. But in disaggregated businesses, that's a much bigger problem. But it, it's therefore where I think there is room for some public policy initiatives to try and uh, create the right circumstances and incentives for digital technology to be adopted in a standardised and uniform way across a particular sector. Question right down the back. Oh, there's one here, and then right down the back. Yeah. Thank you, Shadow Minister. Just in terms of you know, strength, weakness, opportunity and threats, I mean, how extensive is this cyber security on small business and big business going to continue? And have you got any idea what the future looks like there? Uh, well, look, it is, it is a reality of modern business because, you know, we've arrived very quickly over the last, say, 20, 25 years uh, at a situation where almost every business is now networked and almost every business has uh, its customer data stored online. And that's a risk factor that simply didn't exist uh, in most cases 25 or 30 years ago, um, certainly for small and medium businesses. Um, you know, Paper-based records are much slower and less efficient, but um, uh, they don't present the, the risk of being hacked. Now, that's not an argument in favour of going back to paper-based systems, I hasten to add. But it does mean that um, it's something that every business needs to think about um, and... Uh, it's, you know, it's an essential safety consideration for every, every business, just as, you know, you worry about fire safety and the, the physical security of your records or the physical security of your stock. So that's, that, that's, that is an adjustment that business people, including small business people, uh, are having to deal with. Um, and as I say, uh, you know, one of the practical things, in my view, is to uh, use cloud-based applications rather than storing things on uh, physical servers in your own premises 
Um, but it's certainly an area where I think small businesses need to make sure they've got expert advice and, and an obvious place to start is with your accountant. Um, you mentioned the NBN. Mm. Do you think there are any lessons for government and business about how the evolution of the NBN has occurred over the last 10, 15 years? Yeah, well, look, we were very clear um, that we would not have set up the NBN the way that we inherited it when we came to government in 2013. When Malcolm Turnbull was minister and I was his pal sec, I sat through quite a few speeches where he used his standard joke, it was quite an effective joke, which was that, you know, in the words of the, uh, uh, the old joke about um, being in a country town in Ireland and asking how would I get to Dublin, the answer came back, well, I wouldn't be starting from here. Um, and so we would not have started from the way that uh, uh, our political opponents started. Um, but what we inherited was a set of legislation which um, uh, had put the arrangements in place. There were contracts that, that entered into between the Commonwealth Government and both Telstra and Optus, uh, where many billions of dollars uh, were required to be paid by the Commonwealth Government, whether or not the project went ahead in the form it was designed. Um, one feature of what Labor did that we always thought didn't make much sense was they said, we are determined to build fibre to every home in the country, regardless of whether the resident of that home has any interest in acquiring a broadband service or at any rate a broadband service fast enough to need fibre all the way. So just to explain that point, typically you build fibre down the middle of the street and then the connection from that to the home is about, argument's sake, $1,500 per home. So to build the fibre down the street, costs you quite a lot of money per home. To then connect that fibre to run fibre optic all the way to the home costs additional money. When, so Labor's original design was fibre all the way to every home, regardless of whether the customer's ever going to want it. When we announced in 2020 a $4.5 billion upgrade to NBN, the outcome, which will be completed by the end of next year, and which will mean that 8 million premises in Australia are able to order a speed of up to one gigabit per second or a thousand megabits per second, so blinding fast broadband. A key feature of the network design was we said, as part of that eight million, there are gonna be about two million premises that were previously fibre to the node that will now be upgraded. And if you're in that footprint, you will now be able to order a speed of up to one gigabit per second. And if you order it, so throughout that footprint, we'll build fibre down the middle of the street. If you order a service that needs high speed, a speed that only fibre can provide, then we will connect the fibre from the middle of the street to your home. Uh, that is the logical way to do it. That's the way, for example, the New Zealand broadband rollout's been done, their fibre rollout has been vastly more cost effective than Australia's. It's also what Labor has adopted in their announcement uh, of an additional 1.5 million in a further footprint on top of the 2 million that we committed to. So we have managed to, without having too much political fuss about it, move to a more rational strategy now. Um, but look, the bottom line is, and I think we've seen this over the past few days with um, uh, the uh, change position from NBN in terms of what's called the, the, uh, the ICRA, which is a jargon term for the essentially the accumulated losses and whether they're permitted to recover those in the price they're permitted to charge under the regulatory process. Anyway, there's been the Financial Review had several articles about it today for economic regulation pointy heads. Um, but uh, the, the, the bottom line is because of the way Labor set it up, um, it's, you know, a lot of taxpayers' money has been spent on this and there would undoubtedly have been more efficient ways to do it. Um, and if you want to look at a more efficient way to do it, look across... Um, Look across the ditch at what the Kiwis did because they were a lot more efficient. Question there. Is there any question? I, I just want to ask a question about education and mm. the e um, revolution. It's it's not cheap to be illiterate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's cheap to be illiterate. For those kids who come from homes where there isn't a great deal of e mm. whatever e. Um, E-availability mm. of hardware, software, mm. people who know these things. 
How are they going to keep up? It is a it is a sort of middle class revolution. So one of the things I've noticed in this space is in the late 90s, there was a lot of talk about the digital divide. And the fear was that you needed a computer, a laptop or a desktop computer to get online. And that was whatever the number was, $2,000 is the entry price. And that meant only uh, more affluent households would be able to afford to do that. And lots of people would be uh, blocked from connecting to the internet and blocked from, uh, in the case of you know young people, children, young people acquiring the necessary skills. The smartphone really changed all of that. So the smartphone arrived in 2007. And today, the smartphone is the way that a large number for many people, that's the way they get online. Uh, there are over 4 billion smartphones in the world. It's just staggering numbers. And um, as I discovered during my time as Minister for Social Services, um, the majority of people who are, are in need of support because they're homeless have a smartphone. Um, so in many ways, um, the fears of 20 years ago that only people of a certain level of affluence would be able to get online, uh, it's turned out to be very, very different. And I think, um, uh, I think broadly that's a good thing. Um, uh, and so the, um, there's, there's not that divide we're expecting. Um, the other thing I've noticed um, is that assumptions about older people not getting online are not valid at all. Um, and there are plenty of people in their 80s and 90s who are very enthusiastic users of technology. So um, I think some of those early concerns um, have, not been, have not been borne out. I mean, I don't want to sound complacent, uh, of course, there are those who are not getting the access they should, but um, it's turned out to be uh, much more, the, the entry price to get online is much, much lower than was expected 20 years ago. We're getting close to the end, but um, um, we'll go there and then I'll finish up here. So, thanks, Drew. <clears throat> we go. Sorry, thanks, man. Uh, Minister, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Um, my question, which I'm glad I'm at the end, follows on a bit, not so much your topic of cyber security, but the social consequences of the internet. You touched on this in Wide Brown Land, your mm. own book, which I think was excellent. My question is, as the 7.30 report, I think tonight is going to cover, should we be really worried more about the social consequences, the fact that we now, with that connectivity problem, have disconnectivity mm. between people. We're sitting in our homes, we're playing games. The somewhat violence that occurred about a few years ago when a woman, uh, a mother, was said to her husband, please, can you come to the table, take care of the kids? And he threw her out and then everyone else came in to defend her. But in other words, the social problems I feel Sorry, this is not directly on point of your mm. topic, but I know you have the it's knowledge to answer. Yeah. So what is your comment about the social consequence and activity, which I think is just as much as alcoholism or gambling is an activity to okay. the internet? Thank you. Look, it's certainly something that needs a lot of public policy focus, and it was certainly a priority uh, for our Liberal National Government. Um, we came to government in 2013 where they promised to establish what we called the Children's E-Safety Commissioner, we went ahead and did that. It's now called the eSafety Commissioner. Uh, we legislated to give that office significant powers because we weren't happy with leaving in the hands of, for example, Facebook and the other big social media platforms. We weren't happy leaving it to them to say, well, if somebody complains that they've been cyber bullied, if the company says, well, no, we're not going to do anything about it, we didn't think that was satisfactory. So today, if you're a child and you've been cyberbullied, you can complain to the eSafety Commissioner. Following legislation that took effect uh, early this year, uh, if you're an adult and you've been cyberbullied, you can complain to the eSafety Commissioner. And if she and her staff form the judgment that the statutory test has been met, then the material is required to be taken down. So we've been world leading in that. And Julian Mingrand, Australia's eSafety Commissioner, um, is uh, often 
uh, speaking to other governments, doing international conferences and so on. Uh, and as I say, we, we brought in stronger legislation which uh, passed the House in 2021 and took effect from early 2022. So uh, I'm a big believer that the internet has made the world a better place. Um, I think we're all better informed. Yes, we waste a fair bit of our time on trivial stuff. That's very human, but uh, we, we live in a world of abundance of information, which we simply didn't have 20 or 30 years ago. And I, it really strikes me with young people, children and young people, they are, they've grown up steeped in information in a world of information abundance. And I think that, that makes them more knowledgeable about the world. Um, and I, and I, think, I think it's broadly a good thing. Um, but as ever, there are social risks to be aware of and manage. Finally, we um, see you on television tonight, occasionally not as the Shadow Minister of the Digital Economy, but I think as the uh, Minister for Government Services, even though you're not in government. So tell us, what's that all about? Is it fun? Uh, well, so I think you're referring perhaps to the, uh, the job I have as um, uh, Manager of Opposition Business. Yes, well, that, that goes to uh, parliamentary processes. I've learned more about parliamentary processes in the last six months <laughs> than I'd learnt in my previous 12 and a half years in the parliament. Um, so it's things like working out our tactics for question time. What questions are we, are we going to ask? Are we going to move a suspension of standing orders? It's also keeping an eye generally on the flow of legislation. So the person who's got central responsibility for this is the Leader of the House, Tony Burke. Um, but I have responsibility from an opposition perspective, working with our whips, uh, for example, in making sure that if legislation comes back to the House from the Senate, as it can do at quite short notice, that we're clear on whether we're voting for or against and whether we're supporting amendments or not. So there's a bit of organisation, but there's also a fair bit of, I guess, um, uh, strategy in terms of um, the kinds of things we want to focus on in question time and, and in other parliamentary processes. So it's fun. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks to Paul Fletcher for a very informative uh, speech tonight and follow up with questions and discussion. I think uh, we can see from the Shadow Minister that having a background in telecommunications uh, has been great, greatly uh, contributed to uh, your role as a minister and now as a Shadow Minister in this broad area of communication, including digital economy, government services and the like. So. Uh, it was great to have you here tonight, six months after the election. We hope to have you back before the next election, but well done. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you.